have another great or big box which contains some compressor or cooler or freezer and it should be filled with retro goodness so let's take a peek inside here's the first thing which is an Amiga 1200 and it looks wow rough it looks really shitty it's dirty it's painted it's not even screwed together they're cobwebs what did they do to this poor machine well I paid 400 for all of this on a bit which is a reasonable price for a working good condition 1200 this is not that so let's dig deeper maybe there's something of 400 euros value down there so there is more we have an external drive in equally rough condition it's dirty as s we have another external drive test okay we have a few books the eagle linux m68k cd-rom personal paint amiga 1200 manual dirty we have the amiga this looks like some collection of software and we have a modem and we have whiz and pinball mania nice we have an amiga fax modem is this a legit commodore product i have no idea but the spiders seem to like it so it has an amiga print on here seems to be legit okay we have one piece of game controller which is the amiga hyperpad nice but extremely dirty we have a power supply which is the a500 power supply thank you for nothing uh, we have a monitor cable we have tons of discs let's take a peek yeah there are some og discs it seems but most of them are just copies box number one and as if i didn't have enough mega discs there is even more that's a legit copy of worms that's not bad you might notice in my videos that i'm looking for value because i have to recoup some of the money i invest in these machines i'm not rich by any way so it's always good to photogenics always good to get some of the money back because running this channel is pretty expensive if you have to buy stuff all the time to make videos so we will go through all these discs in a second and i will put out the original discs oh defender of the crown i just bought that as a as an original let me show you just bought that in Great Britain or imported it from Great Britain and it's an original Defender of the Crown with all the stuff and it's as far as I know a first release and it's for the Amiga of course because it's the defining game for the Amiga I wanted to have that in my collection okay so let's put all the stuff on the bench and we see you there So I laid out all of the discs on the table and yeah there are quite some copies in there. We have a lot of PD and shareware but we also have some respectable original games and tools. There's a whole stack of tools here.
Okay, I have the Chrome Beast on the bench. I did clean the disk drives, the externals, the modem. I can show you. I pick that up. At least I removed the main grime. Still dirty here. I have to go in there a little uh, more in detail. Same here. Looks like a drive now. Still front dirty. Clean the modem. Looks pretty good. Looks almost like new. So that's a plus. Um, and it even comes with the with the manual, which is nice. So you might wonder why did I pay 400 euros for this? Looks like in stock, like a stock A1200 in really rough condition. Let's call this the Chrome Beast. Um, the lights are missing, no, not quite. They are actually here, lying in here. The keyboard is a mess. Um, I have no idea if it works. And this is the main attraction. And this is an MTech 1230 LC. And this is the whole reason why I bought this Amiga 1200 for 400 euros. I hope that it works and it would be really shitty if it doesn't but let's well give it a try and by the way the idea is to actually remove the paint from the case I have a spare case and actually a new one brand new white Amiga 1200 case and a black keyboard but let's see how far we can get with getting this all off there's the actual batch under here. Yeah, look at this. Actually, something coming off. It's coming off. So there actually is a way to get this all cleaned. Not sure if I'm willing to put the time and work into this but I guess using a magic eraser this should actually be feasible so we will see but now let's just plug it in and see what it does so I did try to turn the Amiga on cleaned the board a little and it just gave me a dark green screen and if you consult the internets it tells you that green screen means memory failure but I think it's just bad caps because that cap over there has some corrosion around it and so I'm gonna change the caps but I don't have all the caps so I have to order a cap set. What I did is I replaced the ones I had which is these 10 microfarad caps with a red dot there and there but all the others um, of the of these leaking ones I don't have. I have these right here which I can use to replace these which is good and after replacing these two 10 microfarad caps I now get a dark gray screen so I might be onto something by the way I have never seen one of these boards and these seem to be specific to SCOM I'm not sure if this is just to convert this drive which is a Panasonic JU25 57A605P um, if this is just to maybe this is just a PC drive and it converts uh, this drive to an Amiga drive using this board because on this board there actually is logic and if you look here there's actually some logic which is interesting not sure if I could just connect a normal Amiga drive without the adapter, but yeah, this looks interesting. Yeah, so uh, no drive activity. I did clean the lights, which had also spray paint on it, um, just to see. And it's a green light, so that works. So I have to recap this board. I already did some of the caps. I put this on here like this because I was really worried to 
pull the traces here or the pads because I couldn't get the solder out of these holes. So yeah, I also ordered a recap kit, so it's uh, about two weeks later now. And these are color coded. I have all these caps here, which I don't really need because I already have them. And it, this goes with this documentation, let's call it that. I will replace the surface mount caps with these surface mount caps, which are just these little things. I hope I can get them on there. As I said, they are color coded. So these should be the 25 volts, 22 microfarad. These should be the 100 microfarad, 16 volts. These should be the 74 microfarads, 25 volts. Almost impossible to see. And these should be the uh, 10 microfarad, 25 volts. <coughs> yeah, I will go off camera, recap the board and uh, show you the result. Right now, this is only showing me a black screen. So yeah, let's hope that it gets back to life and then we can test the machine and we can test the accelerator, which I'm very excited and accelerated about. <laughs> See what I did there? Okay. So here's my finished work. Most of these parts have redone, have been redone. This one, this one under here, this one over here, and the most tricky ones, uh, this one, which is okay, but this one close to the connectors is a tricky one, but still, I think I got it. I did measure continuity from the pads to the caps because the, the caps are a little smaller than the original caps and all seems to be fine. So let's plug it in and see if it works. I will redo this one here um, because this really hurts to see. Um, but for testing this will do for now. Okay, it's all plugged in. Let's see what it does. colors. That's uh, strange. Let's give it a second. Oh, look at this. Awesome. So we actually have a working machine. So this very long start sequence was due to the fact that I did not have plugged in a disk drive. So now let's check the disk drive I put on the LEDs, which should work. And uh, I have a Amiga test kit here, so let's give this a try. So the Amiga is plugged in again, drive is working, and there is a Amiga test kit. Let's see, we have a 68020, mouse is working, nice, AGA. Um, let's check the audio first. Channels are working, nice. Let's check memory. Two max of RAM. Let's test. Looks good so far, which is great news because as I said, this machine was not cheap. And it would really hurt to have a broken A1200, especially considered the custom chips and stuff like that. I don't have that at hand. Oh, these at hand. Yeah, looks good. So let's uh, test the keyboard, which is always a problem, or oftentimes. Yeah, everything works fine. Awesome. Very good. Um, let's check the CIAs, at least the precision timers. And these 
check OK too. Nice. OK, so this seems to be working. Um, now we could put in the accelerator and see what happens. So I did check for this card. I just ordered um, an FPU floating point unit for this, but I just noticed there's one in here. But this info didn't show this. I assume this is because this is the wrong FPU. Because this, I think, is a 33 megahertz CPU or FPU, and you need the 40 megahertz one. So this is 40 megahertz, um, 68 or 30. CPU, you have your real-time clock here, which is dead and bulging, so I will remove this. I have replacements um, coming in today. You have your 4 max of RAM, and this is an MTech T1230 LC Revision 1.0, and this is a card made in Germany, and it's also called a Viper 4. And these cards seem to be very, 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 very rare because I couldn't find one single one sold on eBay or anywhere else, at least here in Germany. And this is a German card. So there's very little information on this card on the internet. There was a 25 megahertz version, which has more documentation because I assume most people bought the 24, uh, 5 megahertz version. You could also have an 8 um, megabyte version. We could populate these right here and make this an 8 megabyte card. But this is a 4 megabyte version. I'm not sure if you can just put on the ICs and be good to go. So this is a nice card to have. And I assume it was pretty expensive back in the day. I will try to find any info on this or on a price, but as I said, there's very little to none info on the internet. So if you know anything about this card, owned one back in the day, anything, just let me know in the comments below, please. Okay, the TF1230 is plugged in. Wow, man, I really hope this works. This would be awesome. Ah, it boots. Success. 68 or 30. Awesome. That is pretty cool. We have four max of fast RAM now and two max of chip mail. This machine just turned from a nightmare that wasn't working, except it was announced as such, to a very good investment. Great. Great, great, great. Okay. And by the way, the idea is to actually remove the paint from the case. So I did clean the bottom part of the A1200 and it came out nicely. It's just one yellow part here. The rest is actually almost stuck, which is quite nice. It came out very well. So that is that. Then I did attempt to actually remove the color from this. And as you can see, I managed to, and I have this uh, sand paper or sand grit sponge. And you can use this to actually scrap away. I will go around the whole case and uh, yeah, we will see how that comes out. Not quite sure, but seems doable. And the only places I can't reach are these spots in here in this grill. But all the other spots should be totally doable. I already did the backside here. Yeah, we will see. Yeah, so that's as far as I did get. It's not easy work. And there are places where it's more color and where it's less color. So this here being a less color place. And I just want to show that 
a bit of elbow grease can actually go a long way. And by the way, through the wet sanding, the case will not crack or get rough or anything. It's pretty good way to do this, actually. And that sponge makes it much easier than normal sandpaper. And I originally planned on going the magic sponge way, but that didn't check out. Didn't work. That's one side and the back white again. That's be interesting here to remove these parts, especially here on the very finicky drive space. But we will see when we get there. We have some stuff in the edges here. Let me see if I can get there. Yeah, so this is possible. But I'm not sure anymore if it's smart because it really takes a lot of time. Didn't expect that. It went very smooth up here where the color was just on a plain, plain piece of plastic. But all these nudges here, not so sure. So I've been scrubbing for the better part of 30 minutes now. And uh, yeah, I will at least have another 30 to 60 minutes ahead of me to get this completely done. So. Okay, so here is what I ended up with after a lot of scrubbing. So there's still the shimmery chrome color in these grooves and there's still the shimmery chrome color in these letters and here and a little here. And now I'm going to use acetone, just a little bit of that, which is normally used to remove um, nail polish and stuff like that and try to remove the color that is still here in these little nudges and here on the inside of these so where you still don't see it and I will try to remove the color in the in the letters and hopefully this will work so let's try so here's my acetone 100% pure this should dissolve once it's used but I can of course always go back and try to uh, use some IPA to clean the rest. So the first spot I want to try this is in these corners here. So if I go in here and see it actually takes this off but it also dissolves the plastic a little. So that is not ideal. So let's maybe first try to get one of these letters cleaned. And that gets sticky pretty fast. And it leaves this residue here. Try with IPA. Nope, that's part of the plastic now. Yay. Let's leave this shine on the plastic, but maybe I can just go and rub this off. Some more sanding. I can feel that the plastic is actually dissolving. So this is not the way to go. Maybe IPA is a better way to do this. Let's check. So yeah, that actually works too. Can see it does dissolve the, the color and it does not, as far as I can see, get into the plastic, which is good. So, this could be the way. This is the way. Yeah, it takes a bit longer, and with a bit, I mean a lot longer. Uh, this is not giving up so easy. I could, of course, use or try to use acetone free nail polish remover. Let me check if I have some. Stole my wife's acetone free 
nail polish remover. Let's see how that goes. Yeah, it's doing pretty much the same to the plastic. Yeah, so you have a little bit of this residue. But not as much as from the acetone. And if you are quick and you use IPA afterwards, it should work. So let's try the other LED. Yeah, I think I did it. It actually takes away the yellowing. That's interesting. So I will sand this down again so that it doesn't have this white circle here around. But this is uh, coming. This is coming along. So after more hours of scrubbing and using acetone and stuff, this is the final result. And you can see it's all clear. I took off the label. Maybe I will use some light sanding again to get the shine off. I had to use a toothpick in these little nudges here to get the color out. Put that into acetone, or no, into uh, the nail polish remover without acetone. So there's still this chrome inside this grill here, but I have no idea how to get that out. So I will just leave it in for now. Yeah, so that is pretty much the state of the case. And here is the final product. Yeah, I know it's missing a label. It still looks dirty, but it's just a chrome color in those ridges here. I can't get in there. So for now, this is how this machine looks. I have a spare case, brand new um, from a1200.net, a white one, which I will use on this machine. But this looks okay, considering how it looked before I got it and it was broken and in all the places. And uh, yeah, ESCOM really went to some cost cutting measures like having the disk drive mounted only on with two screws on the back here and uh, somewhere down there. And instead of using a real metal standoff like in the 600 and I think also the Commodore 1200, uh, A1200 from Commodore. Um, there's not a metal holder for the disk drive here, but just some plastic. So good thing is uh, that thing can't get lost. Bad thing is, well, it's just crap. Yeah, so let's uh, fire it up and do a little sysinfo and then let's try the hyperpad. Okay, machine is ready to rock. Inside the disk. Yeah, LED works. Nice. So this is sysinfo boot, so this boots straight into the sysinfo. Of course you want to see the speed. So let's see the speed. Oh, that's actually not bad. It's even faster than a A3000. Nice, so this, I think, yeah, it's actually the 40 megahertz CPU. Okay, nice, very nice. Okay, no point in doing anything else here, so let's just put in Boulder Dash. Not sure if this works with a stock 030. See if it can start Boulder Dash in Kickstart 3.1. Oh, can. Okay. So we have our gamepad here. Do this. So playing one handed Boulder Dash. Let's see how that works. And through a camera, which is actually even harder. Should I open this? I could. I'm trying not to die. Oh, okay. At least I got six diamonds. <laughs> yeah, so this machine actually works and it works pretty good. So off camera, I did clean the Amiga HyperPad very thoroughly. So I 
I completely opened it up, cleaned all the parts, put it back together, gave it a good scrub. And you can see it really looks almost factory, except for some of the screws, but I'm good with that. So it also cleaned the cable. So this really looks almost factory, which is really nice because I need a good gamepad for my Amiga. Yeah, so what can I say? I changed the case. Hmm. And the machine is now a lighter shade than the original, I think, because this is the replacement case from A1200.net. This is, I think, a pretty new mouse of that era. If you check the colors, this is a bit darker. And this is the mouse that came with the 600 or 1200, I'm not quite sure. So I did something else. I changed the keyboard. This is my A1200 to uh, A500 to A1200 conversion keyboard. So this was an A500 keyboard where I just removed the PCB here and sort of the metal bracket here. So this fits perfectly. I also added a CF card reader, one gigabyte. I have now two hard drives in here, virtual hard drives. I cleaned up my cap mess here and um, put a fitting cap in here, still on top because I didn't want to pull any traces. I am very wary of this. Yeah, that was a pretty interesting project. So if you are thinking about buying the worst possible A1200 and you don't know if you can actually clean it or fix it, hope this video inspires you a little to do that. And it's possible. You can see it's an A1200. It's pretty glossy now which it actually shouldn't be, but it works. It's a 1200, it's a 1200 with a TF1230 for 400 bucks, which is not a bad price. So nobody wanted to touch this thing, literally. I did, and I think I made a pretty good deal in the end. So uh, that's it for this video. Until next time, and bye-bye. Thank you for watching Retro is the New Black. If you're new to the channel, please like and subscribe. If you like the video, please share. Every like, share and comment helps a lot. Until next time, bye bye.